Oh, cute. I don't know if anybody's missing. Oh, well. I like to pretend that some guy in Afghanistan or something is trying to learn calculus from me just because he doesn't have access to a school. So, hey, uh, here's, sorry, I'm starting your lesson a little late. Here it goes. Whatever that is. Uh, when I go to, when I ask you to draw this, I recommend that you might draw maybe two slices. The big figure isn't as important as the slices. Now, at the very edge, that feels like his. But at the region to the right, then we're starting to see a washer, yeah? Track it. And obviously, we have infinitely many slices, so we have just a long stack of all these washers. But I'm only drawing a couple of them. The volume, then, is pi. And we say that this is the sum of many washers, where we need to find What's the big circles area, pi big r squared, and subtract away the little circles area, pi little r squared. So we take out the pi and the height, and we focus on the squares difference. Now, I told you the height is the x or dy. In this case, what's the height? The height is really thin. And I went horizontally that way, so the height is yeah, okay. Now that actually makes sense because we just said if it goes around the x-axis, we should be using x. So that makes sense. Alright. <coughs> now, big R. Um, here, I'm going to do it in black. Here's big R. Or here's big R. Big R is always a reference to the bigger circle. And so you're always going to go, big R is always from the axis of revolution to the outside. What is big R? Is it constant or is it variable? It seems like it's here it's 4 and here it's 4. And so it seems like big R is always. Now compare that to little r. Now I want your eyes to go to the inside circle. Here's the circle we're taking away. Here's the radius of that circle we're taking away. So what does it feel like little r relates to? Little r is? What do you think? It's here, and then it's here. It seems like it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Little r is? Yeah, that's the function. In this case, x squared. Okay? So, little r, x squared. <laughs> so, what's the integration? Are they 0 to 4 or 0 to t? What's the variable of integration? x. What's the region of x value? 0 to 2. All right. Now, let's integrate, shall we? What's the antiderivative of 16? 16x. What's the antiderivative of x to the fourth? One fifth x to the fifth from zero to two. What is 16 times two? Don't you dare use a calculator. 16 times two is 32. And what is two to the fifth? 32 over five. What's the common denominator? Five. What's 32 times 5? 30 times 5 plus 2 times 5? 160 minus 32. What's 160 take away 32? 128 pi over 5. All right, now don't worry about the units, but if we did units, they would be cubic units, right? All right, that's the idea so far. Pi big R squared minus little r squared dx. Try one on your own. <clears throat> now this one you should not use a calculator to graph it, but you may use a calculator once the integral is done, because the integral is a little bit. While you're working, I'll tell you, I would I would I'll tell you the biggest mistake by far on this is not the calculus. The biggest mistake 
it's from misidentifying the region. So when I go to budget my time, I take almost half my time just making sure I have the right region and the other half comes up. Big R, constant or function? Function. What's little r, constant or function? Constant, one or two? One. Limits of integration? Two to eight. Two to eight, and that then is something. Go to around the y axis, the area enclosed by the same, it's, it's actually the same region, this region that goes from 2, 1, 
to what was it? Eight of x. What's y at eight? What's the y value when x is eight on the curve? Log base two of eight is two to what power is eight? If it gets any easier, I'll have to ask a pre-algebra kid. Three, okay. So here we go. Uh, I'm gonna revolve that this time though, I'm gonna revolve it around the y-axis. Might help to draw yourself a little picture in your notes. When the slice goes this way, it's dx. When the slice goes that way, the height or thickness is dy. If I'm going around the y-axis, I must be using y. If I'm using y, the slice goes this way or this way. If I were to look at that from the outside, the side would actually look like a flat hand, but once I look inside, I would be a big hole. with me? Okay. So here goes, pi, it's still big R squared minus little r squared times the height. But now the height is dy, it's just fairly tall vertically. Little or big R. Big R is the distance from the axis of revolution to the outside of the bigger circle. Is that always going to be the same distance or varying? Same. Big R is always 8. Little r is the radius of the little circle. Here's a little circle, here's a little circle, so on. Here's a little circle. So, is that little r constant or varying? Varying. It's the distance to the curve, but it has to be in y term. So instead of log base 2, it's 2 to the y all squared. We're going to do this without a calculator. What do you want to One to three. Okay. <clears throat> now, pi. Easy enough. Antiderivative of 8 squared or 64 is 64y. It's been a while, but there's a way to integrate that well with algebra. 2 to the y to the second is equivalent to 2 to the 2y, or 2 to the 2 to the y, or 4 to the y. That's on the test on Friday. That's the case of the antiderivative of 4 to the y. 4 to the y over log of 4. All right. Pi times, what's 64 times 3? 16 times 3 plus 4 times 3. 192 minus what's 4 to the third? 64 over log 4 minus 64 minus 4 over log of 4. Still, I refuse to use a calculator. What is 192 minus 64? Minus 60 and minus 4. 128. What's negative 64 over log 4 plus 4 over log 4? Negative 60 over log 4. Common denominator is already there. Boom. We'll call it good on there. Okay. That's the idea. You try. Try one on your own. Please make sure you identify the region correctly.
Did you get three answers? Two hundred and thirty-two pi over pi. Yeah. Okay. I should go without saying, but I'll say it anyway. The answer should never be negative. Ever. Always positive value. Yeah. Why one to three? The values have to be y values because y is the value of this variable integration. So the region starts at a low point of y equal one because that's where x equal one starts the region. It ends at y equal three because that's the upper bound of the region. Okay? So y values be careful not to use x values in this case. All right, let's go to a little harder. Two volume, which now you can expect two volumes, but it would have been better just to say, what about this one? Um, let's look at this. Y equals the square root of x. That's easy, huh? I don't make that too dark yet. I'm going to save dark for the region once I get it. X equals 1. Okay, easy enough. And X equals 3, not Y equals 3. So this time, that I'm looking at now. Uh, you know what? It feels like it's not enclosed on all four sides. What am I missing? It needs to be enclosed with this curve, this curve, and the x-axis. I believe I also meant to enclose it with the x-axis. Sorry, otherwise it's an infinite region. My bad. You with me? Now, if that's revolved around the y-axis, then, okay, cool. Why two volumes? Look here and it's sliced. All right, easy enough. Here, it's sliced. Revolve. Looks like those are the same. What's big R? Big R is three and little r is one, and that's true for all, both of those, or all those in there, up to here. Now, when you get up to here, what's big R? Still three, but now what's little r? You can see that, look at this green circle here. It's going to be the same until you get to this upper region, and then the little radius starts to grow, grow, grow. And so because of that, you're looking at one region with that flat side, and then a totally different region once you get to the curve. Right? So for region one revolve, call that actually area one because I have three R's going to me. Pi, how would you get the volume of that? Actually, area one revolve. Could you do that geometrically? It's always the same radius. It's always the same inner radius. Could you find the area of the lower region just straight up geometrically if you wanted to? Yeah. Can you still do it with calculus? Sure. Okay, go so with calculus. In that lower region, what's big R? And what's little r? 1. And dy or dx? dy. What is the integration? What's the low y to the high y of region A? 0, 2, 1. All right. Plus pi of, we start the volume of area 2 revolve. What's big r? Big R here is still 3. But now little r, the inside r, the green circles r, is the function, right? And so in function terms, in x terms, or y terms? So y squared squared d y. From where to where? 1, 2, 3. Root 3, yeah. If x is 3, then y is root 3 for y value. Nice. All right. So you could plug that in your calculator. And don't worry about that. Let's go on to the last one. Let's do that calculator-ish kind of question. 
All right. So say we get four sine squared. Uh, what is, oops. This actually has been on the homework a little. What is sine squared like? Or tell me some attributes to the graph. Does it still have zeros at zero and pi? It does, and two pi and so on. Um, but because of the square, it will not have negatives. And actually, it's a little steeper growing. But as you hopefully notice by now, it's not quite the same as absolute value. Why not? Yeah, it's not sharp. Okay, that square is smooth. And absolute value would be sharp turns. So absolute value would be non-differentiable at the sharps, but this one is differentiable at all risks. So it's that. And I imagine x minus 1 squared is a parabola shifted right 1. 1 is probably in here somewhere. So I'm feeling that kind of region. Now let's go to the calculator to verify. OK? You definitely don't want to find the intersection points on that algebraically. All right, we're back. Here we go. All right, so um, let me calculate it here. Boom. Uh, I'm going to go to open some parentheses, sine x. I forgot my four. Four. Squared. Okay, and then x minus 1 quantity squared. Okay, all right. So, uh, what do I need to do first to my calculator after I graph it? Find the intersection points, and we'll probably want to store those. So... Do we need to store the x and the y, or just the x, or just the y? Just the x. I'll call mine a for the left and b for the right. But it's up to you. Call it Bob and Karen for all I care, or whatever you want. Do -do. Okay, are you getting something like 0 0.337 for x or for the left and 2.380 for the right? Okay. Now then, if we go to evolve this, then I'm going to get a mirrored region and a whole bunch of washers like that, right? So it's a washer case, which means volume is pi big R squared minus little r squared. Because it's around the x-axis, the height is d. What about big R? It is big R constant or one of the functions? And if so, function, which function? Are we going to the outer circle? Are we going up to the sine curve or to the parabola? The sine curve. And so big R is F of X. Little r, we're going from the axis only up to the parabola, yeah? And so little r is G of X. And our intersection points, recording even those to 3, 0 0.337 and 2.380. 
2.380. I don't know if I've made that clear, but when I say three decimals, they expect three decimals on everything they give point to. So that includes limits of liberation and everything along the way, not just the final answer, everything. Um, so you need to report those to three. If you slap that in your calculator, I guess I'm going to go back to my home screen and go to something like pi plus <coughs> um, a uh, I think size is first. Right, be careful with your parentheses. Lots of parentheses going on. Oh. Sorry. Did you get 53.998? Yay. 53.998. All right. Um, that is pretty well it. So tell me, how do you know when to use washers or discs? In what case would you get a disc? Disc if volume review. Disc if the region right up against or joined or enclosed by the axis of revolution. Okay, when there's no gap between the boundary and the axis of revolution, then you're going to get a solid disk with a hole in the middle. Washer, if there is a gap between the region and the axis of revolution. Okay, if, for example, you have like this, and you're walking around the x-axis, you've got a big old gap between you. And so you get that. Great. OK. So the question is never, should I use this, or should I walk and walk? The problem determines that. It's not like a choice. OK. Um, that's it. Questions on last week's homework number five. How did number five go? Did it go super duper great? Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. Just need to say. All right. Four also? Yeah. Four, one, five. Four, one, five. Four, five, five, four, one. Sixteen. Okay. Okie dokie. So, I enjoyed um, five. It was kind of in the news about ten years ago, which so you probably weren't watching the news when you were in it. Well, maybe you were. I don't know. But um, not too long ago, they started actually finally making headway on AIDS research. Okay. Um, and so. It's kind of these drugs start, started to finally put it down the AIDS crisis. Unfortunately, companies were charging like $500 a pill for these AIDS treatments. And while that is possible for rich people in America, it's definitely not possible in Africa where that's the most prevalent case of AIDS, right? So uh, it's very logical that they say, it's like we're dying over here and you're gouging us $500 a pill. Now, what's their justification? Their company's justification for that is, well, I mean, they, the, the, the people were saying, look, I looked at the chemicals in this pill. It costs you maybe 20 cents to make this pill. Now, the companies then responded, yeah, it took me 20 cents to make the second pill. The first pill cost me $200 million, right? So the idea then is, uh, 
uh, how much of her cost? And that's not the pharmaceuticals, but a lot of it is the They don't make up some cost for me if I make that up. Um, so, is the company there to make trends? No. Is the company there to save lives? No. Yeah, if you like to think so, but no. The, the company's there for one thing, and that's money. To make money, yeah. Uh, they're not cheap. So, um, would, would these people have an argument if they said, you know what, you've already made that for research and development cost, and you're still charging $500 for it. Now, they, would they have a little bit of a, you know, yeah, yeah. So you can say on an ethical reason, you're, you're gouging people in their health. Um, and that, you, you can have an ethical argument. That said, then, this is called, this is, I, is the idea of a economy of scale. And uh, it's good stuff to learn from on this case. And it does actually have a math for a rational function, which is what we learned yesterday, application to it. Um, give a function for the total cost of producing N pills. There are two components to the cost, or how much this company has paid out total. What's one of the components to the total cost that this company uh, has looked at? The hundred million. Right away, they've paid a hundred million. And that's before they have made a single pill per month. They've already paid out $100 million. All right, so they've got the list. They paid chemists for 10 years to figure out this biochemist, this recipe. And then they did tests on animals for five years. And then they did tests on humans for five years. And finally, 20 years later, it's the market. Boom. Now, 40 cents a pill, on top of that $100 million, they have to also pay 40 cents for every pill. And you have to multiply that 40 cents times how many pills. Yeah. Okay? So, I wish I would have put this question in, but stick with me. I'll ask the, if they produce only one pill, how much does that pill cost? A hundred million dollars and 40 cents. If they cost, if they make two pills, how much does each pill cost? Fifty million dollars and forty cents. What's the total cost? Fifty million dollars and forty cents, right? What if they make ten pills? How much does each pill cost? Ten million dollars and forty cents. If they make a hundred pills, how much does each pill cost? A hundred uh, million dollars and forty cents. If they make a million pills, how much does each pill cost? Hundred dollars and forty cents. Now, even if you make a hundred a million pills, they're still going to pay a hundred dollars a pill. Uh, now, then, if you're in the pharmaceutical business and there's a disease out there that only you know, only a hundred people have, is it going to be worth it to research solving that disease? No. Okay. So, first thing is you're only going to tackle the big fish, the ones that are affecting a lot of people because that's how you're going to make your money. All right. Uh, unless it's, you know, your kid with that disease, in which case, I guess, it doesn't matter to you, you're going to do everything you can. Um, so let's talk then about cost per pill. All those calculations we did on cost per pill. Every time we did the unit cost or the cost per pill, we were always doing the same calculation. We were taking that hundred million and dividing it up among how many pills. And so we divided it by n in every case. And that then is dividing up the startup cost among lots of pills. <coughs> and as you make more and more pills, that startup cost is distributed among more and more pills, and the startup cost per pill is reduced, right? On top of then, that besides the share of the startup cost, you also have to pay per pill 40 cents. Okay? Now you could also, another way to look at that is to say, all right, if that's the total cost, I could take that total cost and divide it by the number of pills. Those are the same. If I split the fraction over n, they come up to the same thing. You with me? Okay, after how many sales does the company break even? You break even when your money going out is equal to the money coming 
in. What do you call that? Money you take in. Revenue. Okay. Revenue equals expenses in this case, cost, which is empty. True that. All right. We want to know when our revenue equals cost. What's the revenue that you're collecting? The money you're collecting is 75 pence. 75 dollars per pill times the number of pills. What's the cost function? Is that talking about unit cost, cost of one, or cost total? Cost total, 100 million plus 0.4 N. So this to me is the beauty of math. If you have your eyes open, it's not just simple pushing. Tell me what that equation means. 74.6 N equals 100 million. 74.6, what is it? Oh. Profit, that's the profit per, for one pill. Okay, $75, take away the 40 cents. You're making $74.60 per pill, and you want to know then how long it's going to take you to make back your 100 million. So N, rounded to the nearest pill, is 1 million, 340,000, 483, I have that right? Okay, do we agree? Okay, roughly a million pills down the line, um, you break even. Okay, uh, gosh, that would be. Just occurred to me, what? I, I, this is a cynical question. What would be better, a pill that treats the disease but doesn't eliminate it, or a pill that eliminates it? Surely that doesn't calculate, it's going through that calculation. But if they can cure it, they cure it, right? Uh, if somebody becomes a biochemist, do you please come back to me and answer that question? Because I, I will weep for humanity if you could have cured the disease and you. Oh my goodness. Let's not assume that's not true. Okay. Uh, ask the number of pills. Does anybody want to be like one of these people, biochemists? That's super smart. You guys are all smart. You could do that. Here's something awesome. All right. As the number of pills sold grows without bound, uh, I have a student. This I, I get off the topic. Sorry. I had a student, Colin Coleman. He had cancer in high school, and he became a biochemist, and he's still trained to cure cancer. That's awesome. Is it seen? And I'm brilliant. Uh, as the number of pills sold grows without bound, what does the cost per pill approach? Um, here's the cost per pill right here. And so if I take the limit as the number of pills grows without bound on 100 million over N plus 0.4, what does that cost per pill approach? 0.4. And what's going on there is you could say, as you distribute that 100 million startup cost among billions and billions of pills, then that's not so much, and it's just, just about the raw material cost. In fact, there, this whole problem is a rational function where you're gradually <coughs> approaching the horizontal axis. All right, so that is why I threw that in there. It's a good problem for rational function. Uh, let's go on to, did anybody read the you didn't ask about 17, so four, here we go. Four, 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 here we go. Um, did you get to that volume is pi over three x squared y? Did you get the Pythagorean theorem substitution fact? If the answer is I don't know, then you probably didn't. But, um, so this is, this might have been the frustrating thing for you. When you go to look at this, it's x squared plus y squared equals 4 root 3. Wouldn't it be a heck of a lot better to sub for x squared than it would for y? Yeah, and, and, and unfortunately, they asked you to solve for y. That's terrible. Um, x squared, by the way. Did you have something like that? If you did it all in x terms, it's x squared root 48 minus x squared. If you did it all in y terms, 
it's actually more like y times 48 minus y squared. Those both could work to maximize the volume. Uh, did you say, well, they told me to use x, and I'm a rule follower, so I'm doing it that way. Or did you say, well, that should be, I'm using y. Which one did you do? X, you're a rule following kid. Ah, boy, all right, here we go. I definitely would have taken these away. Good for you. Um, so v prime is pi over 3, and by product rule, x squared, derivative of that is 1 half root 48 minus x squared times negative 2x plus the second stays the same and the derivative of the first pi over 3 times 2x root 48 minus x squared. Do you agree with my product rule? I would imagine if you got hung up it was maybe on the, the uh, algebra of it. I'm going to pull out a common factor of 2x and a pi over 3, if you don't mind. When I do, this is negative x squared over 2 root 48 minus x squared. And this is just root 48 minus x squared. Cool? Common denominator is 2 root 48 minus x squared. And this becomes negative x squared plus 2 normal 48 minus x squared. Therefore, 2 pi x over 3 times, uh, what do we got there? Negative 3 x squared plus 96 over 2 root 48 minus x squared. Do you agree with that? So, our critical numbers are x equal 0 square root of 32, or 4 root 3. 0 is illogical. 4 root 3, if it's equal to the slant height, that means also no cone. So that's not really a possibility. I'm feeling root 32 is a critical number. That is, that's going to result in the max value. Um, after that, it says dimensions. So you know x, so you need to find y. Does that get you going? Cool. Now, uh, one, does anybody need one still? You want me to keep working on one? Okay. Particle move on the other line. Acceleration is 2t. Velocity is 10 at time 3. Velocity at time 3 is 10. And velocity. Uh, oh, you're good? Yeah. Don't assume they give you the initial. Okay. Anybody need 16? Yes. Okay. Uh, nope. 16. 16. Is that, uh, it's not a place, is it? It's kind of a book. Okay. So I'll do it real quick. All right, did you get a derivative of yep. negative? This is an it. This right? Okay. Did you get a derivative of negative x over y? Okay. Slope is 2. Could be at two places. Negative x equals 2y or x equals negative 2y. That has to be also on the circle itself. So you do something like negative 2y squared plus y squared equals 25. So 4y squared plus y squared is 25. So y squared is 1. So, oh no, y squared is 5, right? 5y squared is 25. So y squared is 5. So y is positive root 5 or negative root 5. And if x, y is root 5, then x is negative 2 root 5. That's one solution. 
And if x is, or y is negative root 5, then x is positive. Yeah, that makes sense that the first and third quadrants would have positive slope. Okay? Do do do.